Uh, welcome to our webinar, Data-Driven Corporate Culture. What do you think is the opposite of a data-driven culture? We believe that the opposite is an expert-based culture where knowledge is accumulated by humans throughout their experience based on what the world was five years, 10 years, 20 years ago. The problem is that the world is changing at a faster pace and we can't afford to wait for 10 years to build new expertise. So we all need a faster, better culture than one based on experts. So first, to cover this topic, we will have a look at a few stories to enlighten us on the fallibility of human making decisions and predictions. We will look at why corporates want to become data-driven, what are the most common crimes committed against data, what is at the core of a data-driven culture, and finally, how to start that transformation, followed by a summary and a Q&A session. So let's start with a few stories about experts. Story number one, the most renowned experts are the worst at predicting the future. This is what Philip Tetlock proved by conducting a long study on several hundred proeminent experts in politics, science, economics. He asked them to make predictions about the future, the way they were all doing already on the most prominent US media at that time. The only difference is that he recorded those predictions and tested the outcome against what happened in the, in the coming three, five, or 10 years. The results were slightly better than a time cost, 50-50, and always worse than basic extrapolation on the initial condition. The most interesting finding was that the more famous the expert were, the less their prediction turned out to be correct. Story number two. Intuition can lead to great outcome or great disasters. In his bestseller book, Blink, Malcolm Gladwell dissects intuition in very different contexts, from art curation to police shooting, philharmonic orchestra recruitment. In these very different examples, he noticed a few patterns emerge on catastrophic decisions made by experts. Number one, the inability of experts to assess a new situation and to identify the key differences with the usual situation. Number two, the more data the expert asked for, the more they were likely to make the wrong intuitive decision. This was mainly due to the third fact, the confirmation, confirmation bias, that led experts to only retain the information that validates their initial intuition instinct and to discard the rest. And finally, Gladwell highlights how in situation of crisis, protocol, processes, and procedures are often discarded, despite the fact that this is when they are most useful. Story number three. When all the experts in a field are wrong, nobody noticed, until a great character changes the game forever. This is the story of Billy Bain. He started his career as a college baseball player, he then completely fell at his poor career. And his own feeling was that he was victim of a selection process that put him where he didn't belong. Strangely enough, he became a talent scout himself for the Oakland A's. And he witnessed how the old baseball scouts were perpetuating a flawed selection process. He then became the manager of the Oakland A's. And he demonstrated that everybody in the baseball world was looking at the completely wrong metrics. He proved it as he was able to hire the players that were discarded by the other clubs. He paid his player between a third and a tenth of the salaries that were offered by the other clubs throughout the USA. And then he kept beating those richer clubs season after season until they noticed and they all adopted the same analytics, changing the baseball game forever. Despite those examples, too many companies rely on intuition, gut feeling experience to make strategic decisions that can cost them dearly. So tell us, Guillaume, why some corporates are looking for a different way of doing things. So thank you, Stéphane. Um, in this section, I will cover the reasons why 
corporates make the choice of relying on decisions rather than predictions going to see fortune teller in other words. So to begin with, let's have a look at the traditional way to make decisions. So it all starts at a given point in time when, based on the data available, a decision is made by a committee of experts and decision makers. These strategic decisions lead to a series of planning decisions. That means what we do, at which date we want to do it, and what are the desired results by this date. Uh, at these steps, responsibilities are also shared within the organization. Then operational decisions come. Processes are changed and tools are made available and hopefully also tools to collect the, uh, the necessary data. Eventually, only once all these decisions have been made, the process, uh, the process begins by execution. And then data starts being collected and results start to be available. So that's the moment where controllers will compare the results we got with the planning decisions and logically start making assumptions about why the results are the same as we expect or more likely why they are different. And then based on these results, new decisions are made, which can be to continue on the same path, to stop totally the, uh, the decisions that were taken before and or to start doing new things. So now let's take a step back from this process and uh, look at more than one cycle, look at several cycles linked to each other. Then some interesting things start to appear. First, we can see that when decisions are made, they are made based on the data that was collected in the previous cycles with different objectives. In the end, the decision that is made is not made on the actual data at the time. It's made on the prediction of what is going to come. In other words, it's made on belief. So that's the first thing. Second thing, there's a blind zone, which happens when, in the time when we are implementing the new decisions. During this time, the operational teams are going to think that the data is not relevant anymore because things are changing. So the data collected before should not be relevant. We are going to get the new data and change the way we are doing. So during that time, there's this period of high risks. Actually, companies are not running anymore on data at all. They run on the faith that the reality will match the production, which may happen or may not happen. So the question is, are you doomed to make decisions that relies on the data from the past? And should you really make all your decisions based on faith, belief, based on predictions? So that's the question. So of course, the answer is no. When a company culture is data-driven, decisions are not made on predictions anymore. So first of all, the data are collected continually. Of course, the, these companies are adding relevant KPIs. They are changing the KPIs they are looking at. But the fact is they never stop collecting the data. There is no data gap in such an organization. So when the time of making a decision comes, it is not based anymore on a tentative to predict the future. It is made on the certitude that relevant data will be available at any time in the future because we never stop collecting. So let's look at that chart. Let's imagine we are looking at a sales turnover about a particular product in a store. So uh, when the data decision is made, the decision maker are looking at a series of different possible scenarios. Scenario A, they are going to make the following, they are going to say the following thing. Scenario A, we add more product in store because it's selling good. Scenario B, maybe it's time to change, uh, to change the product price or to launch a discount campaign. Scenario C, well, maybe this product is not selling that good, so we may want to bundle it with another product that sells better and get rid of the stock. So what happens there is data keeps being collected and the same indicators are always collected. We are looking at sales turnover here. So the actual actions are based on the data, 
not prediction of the data. And the decisions can then be made much more frequently. So the deviation between the, the forecast and the actual data can be acted upon much more often and the organization is empowered. In the end, that's the way e-commerce platforms like Amazon are running since years and that's one of the reasons behind their success and that's the reason why they are going this way. So now we can take a look at another reason why corporates are taking this path. So the question is here, what would Gotham City be without a Batman? And what is the role of Batman in Gotham City? We know that people are at the heart of companies and in each company there are experts which know how to react on dangerous situations they met before. Some of them are even better than that. They are heroes because they can tell and act before a bad situation even happens. But relying on heroes is a dangerous path. And basically, accumulated experience is an asset that can depreciate very quickly. So the question here are, what happens when the hero is leaving the company? Is a hero able to share his, his knowledge with other people, train them or not? And finally, when the company keep growing, how, where, do, where does, do they find the next hero to replace the, to grow the company? So in the data-driven company, there are still skilled people. And these skilled people are trusting each other and trusting the data they get. They are working with more discipline, looking at the data, and in the end, they can replace each other. They can get healthy career paths. They are not locked in a position, they are not locked anymore in a position because they, they are the necessary people there. In the end, we can see that defining KPI, consistently measuring them and making sure that the results are available to everyone and not hidden, can transform all employees to heroes. So that's another good reason why data-driven corporates are going this way. Now I will let Stefan speak again to go through the common mistakes to avoid when going data-driven. Yes, Guillaume, thank you. Uh, except we don't call them mistakes. We call them crimes because we think they are way too severe and that the perpetrator of those crimes deserve a harsh punishment. Every day in corporates, data are treated badly. Abduction, torture, silence. So for obvious reason, we have changed the name of the person involved in the real life examples that we're going to use right now. Abducting data removes critical insight. What happens when Bob declares, the consumer group love the new campaign? What critical data is missing in that statement? When Kathy claims, the distributors are taking large orders, what critical data is she missing? And when Amy noticed that the employees complain they are not paid enough, is she looking at the right piece of information? In the first case, Bob doesn't tell us the size of the group if it is representative of the consumer at large. He also doesn't tell us what love means. How is it measured? How much love? By how many, how many percentage of the group, of the consumer group? In the second example, Kathy is only looking at the sell-in, not at the sell-out. Ramping production with this data could be a mistake. And in the third case, Emily, Amy only listens to the employees. She does not benchmark the company's salary grid to the market. So try and catch yourself before you abduct data from your statement, from your report, or when you try to attract the attention to the wrong piece of information. I know that some of you here may have committed these crimes recently. I know who you are. But there's more harm you can do. Torturing data may give the illusion of being data-driven, but will always backfire. When Liam is looking at the three month average of new followers, why is he doing this? What will happen after Lauren's boss asks her for higher forecast? Why does Anna compare two consecutive months and not year to year? Liam probably changed the metric because the month-to-month -month comparison was not so good this time. Changing metric because it looks better is the opposite of being data-driven. 
manager asking for better data without changing the underlying hypothesis are planning for failure. Lauren will have taught to torture the data to make it lie to her boss. And the final result at the end of the year will probably be closer to Lauren's initial prediction than to the lie that her boss asked from her. When Anna compares November, including the 11-11 sales to October, she's comparing apples to oranges. And she probably knows that. So if you have never noticed any of this behavior in your organization, congratulations. You are already in a data-driven organization. But if you have noticed similar behavior in the past, it may be a good time to change. And yet, you still can do more harm. Silencing data removes any chance of getting an accurate picture of the situation. When Liam hides part of the data, his report looks better, but he hides the true nature of the situation. Because Kathy's big boss has a history of killing the messenger, the data presented to him will always be partial. This is a very important part of a data-driven corporation. The data is the data. You want the person that presents it to tell you the whole truth. Even if it's not good, even if it's ugly, we'll have to know what it is first before we can act. Shin, Shin may just have simplified his report, but he will miss critical warnings in the future. So all these examples that we've seen tell you why data shouldn't be loaded with point of views, opinions, or agenda. It should be as pure and transparent as possible. So Guillaume, now that I've pointed out crimes that are committed against data, can you tell us what happens in a data-driven corporate? So sure, I'm going to, uh, to do that through the example of a data-driven sales and marketing team. So very important point there, data-driven corporates, they breathe data. So as a human being, you don't even need to think about breathing. Whatever the activity you engage in, it is so much of a priority to breathe that you don't even know you are doing it. So in a data-driven organization, collecting data and looking at data is the same. So we know that companies need to stay in front of the trends. They always need to get new tools, to get new practice, to use new technologies. I have a few examples uh, here on, on the slide of technologies useful in, in store, which are appearing every day, which might be disrupting the business and setting new standards, or on the contrary, might not prove that useful and might be quickly fading away. Teams need to make sure that anyway, they try to implement them, they use them in the right way to make sure that in the end, the consumers are staying with them. They cannot be left behind and not implement a new tool. But the question here is how many teams are ready to make the most of the data this tool will, will generate? When a new project comes, uh, a lot of, uh, of sales and marketing teams will, um, will uh, think that integration of the data is not, the, the, is not important, but it must not come in the way and that, for example, a pilot, uh, it's okay for a pilot to not collect data using the corporate standards. But, and that completing the project is the most important. But in the end, to be successful, a project must prove its value. And to prove the value, there's nothing better than expressing it in a corporate common language, in words that everybody can understand. So in other words, collecting data, measuring performance, and acting on results have to be the first priority, to the point that if a project is not able to communicate its data and to connect with the data source of a company, then it should not happen. For a data-driven team, not being able to immediately get the data should be the same feeling as to stop breathing. So it's so easy to breathe and in life that nobody would think it's a right idea to stop breathing and that it would give you an advantage. Well, it's the same for, uh, for being data-driven. Data must be collected, and to make it as simple as breathing, well, what should be done? So that's the thing I'm going to go through, how to make collecting data as easy as breathing. 
So one answer to this question is to try and keep things simple when collecting data. So being data-driven, that means agreeing in advance on what is the data collected at any time a project starts. So here we are going to take a look at a very simple data model that we implemented in real life with one of our customers, which wanted in the end to have a place to collect and to look at all the data generated by tools they were playing with in store. So in this model, there is three very simple pieces of data. The, in the center, there is the individual, so recording all the persons which at some point have interacted with us in some way. Then there is the transactions that these individuals have taken with us, and transactions in the sense that this generated revenue or generated cost. And on the other side, there is interactions that these individuals take with the, with the company, which can be browsing a web page and looking at a product, staying 10 seconds, 20 seconds, 30 seconds on a product page in our e-commerce website, or entering a store and asking a question to someone. As long as we are able to capture this data, we make sure that it's saved in the data model. And what is very important here is that we built it in a way that these links are not necessary. We doesn't, it's okay to have an interaction without yet being able to identify an individual. The target is to collect the data and to be able to do the most of it. And that's very important to keep in mind because a lot of IT departments, a lot of software providers are going to tell you that systems don't work that way. You need to have an individual to be able to go on. And this kind of complexity will get in the way. So here, the, the data collection is simple and we keep all the collection as simple as possible. But although the data is simple, we can still learn a lot from this data. We can learn, of course, revenue trends by products, by categories. We can learn a lot about individuals coming in and coming out of your, uh, of your field of investigation. And we can record a lot of investigations, whether they are positive or negative, and measure them per person coming in. So once we have done that, uh, what is more important is we can now make decisions based on this data. So let's have a look at the feedback loop. So going back to the decision model I explained in the first section, it is now very practical to apply it to a sales and marketing team. The objective of launching a sales and marketing campaign should not be anymore to collect more data to be able to make decisions or to get more followers so that we know our customer better. A data-driven team will continuously collect the data, measure KPIs in all situations. So the campaigns can be planned to be triggered on particular events and scenarios which are, uh, which are happening within the campaigns. Uh, we can take here, for example, the example of the e-commerce platform Cdiscount. They are famous because they look at all their sales data at midday, at noon, and then based on what was the data in the morning, they are able to adjust their sales in the afternoon. So if we take back the, the, uh, the example seen before, all campaigns are feeding data in the, in the system we are. People decided in advance, decision makers decided in advance what will be their reactions to a planned scenario. So then the feedback loop comes in place naturally and marketing and sales campaign becomes naturally data driven. So the question is, the question that they ask themselves is what they do, what to do is the, if the number of followers does not increase? Well, we don't react in the last minute anymore because the data was continuously uh, looked after or continuously collected and the plan is ready for that case. Anyway, the number cannot be a big surprise because as we said, the data is always monitored. So now, uh, Stefan, can you tell us what is the first thing to do when a company is becoming data-driven? Yes, Guillaume, but I would like to you, it is not easy. Otherwise, every company would already be data-driven. So I hope we have participated today to raise awareness, which will make it possible to start that transformation at the top and to infuse a strong sense of ownership and accountability throughout the company. 
If you want employees to pay attention, make it clear what's in it for them. To motivate employees to change, use the coach favorite question. What will happen to you if you don't change? Few employees want to make bad decisions. Actually, none of them. But in a non-data driven company, that will happen over and over and over again. For every position within your organization, for every job description, there is always a better, faster, more data-driven way of doing your job today that is done by somebody else, somewhere else. You have to move in that direction because this is how you will remain employable in the future. Losing ground to a competitor is of course a bad thing for the company, but it's also bad for the employees. If you work in a company and your competitors are more data-driven than you, what are the chances that they're gonna come and push you? Being data-driven as an employee frees up a lot of your time and it reduces a lot of stress. It removes the necessity of crunching data manually and it reduces the uncertainty and the stress, the stress generated by making a gut decision. You will work on data, you will work on certainty. Now that we hopefully have convinced everybody on the call that it is better to work in a data-driven company and have a data-driven mindset and way of doing things, let's start the process. And it must start at the top. If you can't start at the top of the organization, then don't start. Maybe your CEO today is already data-driven. How would you know? What does a, such a CEO look like? What question can you expect from this type of CEO? What is the management style that comes with being a data-driven CEO? And what KPIs is the CEO willing to submit himself? As the CEO of System in Motion, a few years ago when we implemented our KPI system and tie everybody's bonus to the result of that KPI, I first established my KPI. Why do I need to deliver? What am I ready to commit to? And I tie my bonus to my KPIs. It was then obvious that the rest of the organization will follow that. So when you have a data-driven CEO, everything else becomes easier because such a CEO will not tolerate any behavior that will not be based on hard evidence from the CMO, from the CEO, from the CEO, from the CIO, from anybody in the organization. And that leadership will follow through the organization. Think about Jeff Bezos. Do you think he is not obsessed with data? Do you think he hires people who are not obsessed with data? What about Jack Ma? Yeah. So while the organization aligns itself with a strong data-driven management, it becomes obvious that it's every employee's responsibility to participate. Every employee must take ownership of their own data. This is the only way the transformation can be successful. In his book, What Get You Here Won't Get You There, Marshall Goldsmith explains that the easiest way to change a behavior is not to try and learn new behaviors. That's just too much work. It's just too complicated. Instead, what is very easy, at least easier, is to stop your bad habits. The same goes here for this transformation. Try and stop yourself and your colleagues in meetings and discussion to use the following sentence. The system has the wrong data. The report is wrong. The numbers don't add up. I did not get the data in time. I trust that you can continue that list by yourself. Data ownership implies that no blame is on the data of the system. The data owners must know their data, measure its quality constantly, and protect it from the various crimes that can be committed against them. This is when you know you have a true data-driven corporate culture. So a data-driven culture has to replace an expert based culture to ensure fast, dynamic decision making, protect the data, make the data management as natural as breathing, 
start at the top and instill a sense of ownership and accountability. To do that, you do need to collect more information. You have to increase its quality. You need to implement the right system and processes. You need to break the silos between the system. You need better tools for better analytics. These are all necessary in this transformation process, but it is not enough. You also need to start at the top. Otherwise, don't bother. Everything that matters must be measured. If you don't measure it, it does not exist. Having data to support negotiation decision is non-negotiable. Shortening the feedback loops is critical to, to avoid getting surprises by rapid changes. We are all living through a time of unbelievable change. Opening data access to everybody is necessary to create transparency. That leads to trust, trust in the data, trust in other data owners in your colleagues and develop a strong sense of ownership and accountability. So now is the time for us to open the floor for questions. So Thibault, do you have any question for us or everything was crystal clear? Oh yes, there are great questions. Thank you guys for, for this sharing. I'm going to begin with the, the first one. Um, do you guys recommend that the change starts at the top? Uh, does it mean we all need to wait or what do we need to start with? <laughs> no, you don't need to wait because when the, when the change really starts and when either your current CEO becomes obsessed with data or CEO change or a new CEO comes in and that CEO becomes data driven, you better be ready. So you need to educate yourself and you need to ask yourself, every question that you don't want anybody to ask you today. This is a trick I use also internally with the team. You know, when we prepare a presentation, when we prepare a, a proposal, we always ask, I always ask the team, what is the one question you don't want anybody to ask you? So answer that question first, because this is the most critical one. If it's a tough question, you can be sure that a data-driven manager, a data-driven CEO will ask you that question because that's the one that hurts and that's the one that is important. So no, don't wait. All right. And as the CEO of your firm, is it one of the one of your practices? Is it something you're applying yourself? Uh, yeah, as I, as I explained in the presentation, I set up my KPI first. I hold myself accountable. I look at the data every day, every week, every month. And we have a, we have a regular process of looking at the KPIs of adjusting them when we think they're not the right one. And what Guillaume explained as well, we predict what will be the decision when the next round of data comes in. So we do that, uh, we apply exactly what, uh, what Guillaume explained. Very clear. Thank you, Stefan. Um, it seems to be that some of our viewers have you know, some, some pain points right now in, in this idea of adopting a data culture. One of them, one of the difficulties is the place of, of all these people in this new data-driven world, but some of the constraints apparently are the governance of the data, as well as in general, the business model of all the data that you are collecting from different partners. You know, you're working with Alibaba on one end and an and, and API provider on the other end. It seems also to be a, quite a, a limitation to, to the change in place. Is it true or do you think there are uh, all the pain points that we did not discuss yet? You want to take a uh, Yeah. Um, so yes, it's, uh, it can be a pain point and that's, uh, that's exactly what I was uh, trying to, to go through when I was saying it has to become as easy as breathing. It's not at the beginning. And uh, it, takes, it takes some, uh, some discipline and some preparation somehow to make sure that whenever you have a piece of data that you want to collect, giving back this data whenever you are, uh, I don't know, connecting with a new platform, you're right to mention Alibaba. The question is what they are giving us and what can we really integrate in our data system? The target there is to be uh, ready to, to get this data and work with it. But as there's also a question of change in, of culture there. Uh, there is a big difference between giving up on getting the data because it's not exactly like you would expect it 
to be. And because, let's say, for example, the sales figures are not going to match perfectly with the sales figures with an over platform, no, you should still think about let's get the data in, let's have a look at the trends, let's have a look at how it behaves, because in any case, we are not going to operate in this platform without getting the data it takes. So it's also a question of changing the, the culture. I've been through, through projects, for example, where, uh, where with companies which were not data driven at all, which were looking at different figures coming from different places and asking all the time, why the stock figures I get from system A is different from the stock figure I get from system B. And at the moment they see the numbers are not the same, they stop looking at the numbers and they want real numbers. So usually system B is older, system A is newer, that means system A is wrong because okay, guys, how can we be working with wrong data since years? It's impossible, right? So what's happening there is that when the data comes in, it should be accepted. Differences can have a lot of reasons in, but whatever comes, when you look at the stock figures and they are evolving in such a way, you want to make decisions based on that and not reject it as wrong because it breaks the beliefs that you had before. So it's, uh, it's a challenge and that's exactly what we are talking about when saying there is a cultural change in getting the data in and working with it. Thank you, Guillaume. Very clear. There is one more question that is uh, being raised. We'd love to have your view on this one. Uh, what's your take on opening data to all the partners within your ecosystem? I think this is already adding on to what you were saying right now. Could you share from experience perhaps any, without giving away the name of the brand, uh, some of your past clients that are already setting up a data pool for all of their ecosystem, all of the partners together? So, I mean, first of all, you have a, you have a general movement of open data that you're probably aware of because I'm, I'm sure you've been, uh, the wagon has been participating in those hackathons. Um, so at the city level, at country level, at, at regional level, there is this movement that when data has value and you share it, you can get more data in return. You know, uh, if you are not giving enough data to your suppliers, if you're not giving enough data to your to your clients to make decisions, eventually you will suffer from it. You know, um, it, it doesn't mean that you can open up everything and 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 put everything on the internet right away. This is of course a gradual a gradual step. Uh, but I guess what we've seen in open data challenges and, and open data movement is a proof that you can have value added on your own data if you open it up. You know, you need to know what you're doing, of course, um, but you don't need to know exactly the value you're going to, to get out of it. You know, typical example being a, being a service company, there's never, ever, ever enough information in a, in a brief that we receive for a project, you know. So we need to go out and get and get this information. This happens all the time. You know, you give information to a supplier to manufacture products. There's always a gap and there's always room for for improvement. So when you not only open the data but build that feedback loop, that 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 part where you get data, they get your data, you get their data. This is where you can you can create value that you that you didn't expect before. Now that's a process has to go step by step. You can't open everything. And it's the same question also internally. You don't want to open all the databases to all the employees, but there needs to be an increasing level of transparency because again, internally, different departments can create value with each other by looking at different data, not keeping it too much to, their, to themselves. Okay, clear. Thank you, Stefan. A tricky question here. I think there are things you cannot measure in a company. How do you deal with this? I mean, uh, I think we can measure almost everything. <laughs> uh, Sometimes you can't measure the actual thing, but you can measure what we, you can take what we call a proxy. So you can have a measure that is there, that is real, that gives you um, a sense of what the, the, the real data behind is. You know? Whenever you do a satisfaction survey with clients, you don't really have access to their feelings, right? You're using a proxy. Uh, I know Decathlon, you have a, you have a satisfaction uh, tablets in your, in your stores with free smileys. So, and you only give free options. So you don't have that level of granularity, but still this is a very important tool. 
So you're not measuring the actual sentiment, but you find a proxy that tells you, and um, Guillaume said a very important word just now, you measure a trend and you measure where things are going. So I would, I would say the other way around, if you really cannot measure it or there's no proxy, there's actually no way to make any decision because if you, even if you make the best decision to solve that problem, if you cannot measure the effect, you will never know what you did. So somehow the things that you cannot measure, try harder to measure them. And if you really cannot measure them, then you have to give up. You have to, you have to leave them on the side because then there's no feedback loop and there's no way for you to know if you made the right decision, you moved the needle in the right direction. All right, super cool. <laughs> Do you think this is a technology topic at the end? Yeah. Uh, the topic, uh, the, as we said, it starts by what is the, what, whether the people are going to be able to look at the data, to act correctly at the data. And I think from the, the presentation you have been seeing, uh, the technology part were very, very, very small. So in the end, uh, there's not much about technology at the very beginning of stuff, but you must define the, the tools which are going to really help the, the company applying this culture and not getting in the way. That's what I was, uh, I was trying to express when I was looking at the different type of project that the sales and marketing team can, can involve. The key question there is whether the technology gets in the way saying, ah, okay, but to integrate this uh, new camera with the system, we must have a named individual. Okay, and then getting in the way and making workarounds, trying to get through. So that's technology which will prevent you from being really data-driven. On the other hand, are the data really simple to collect and you can always find the right piece of data inside your, uh, your data warehouse, because that's what we, we are talk talking about in the end to collect and uh, generate the, the trends that you're looking for. Yes, there should be. And that's not easy. That means a lot of work in advance when designing projects, when uh, making the decisions, thinking about how do we collect the data? How do we get it in? And that's why uh, most of these companies which are data driven today, they are technology company. So the technology is not a question there. And that's a, that's a key question. So yes, technology will help you to achieve that. But in the end, it's a question of mindset. And uh, I, mean, I would like to add to, to Guillaume that it's, for me, it's not a technology, even if you need technology, it's really about strategy. And this is one reason why it's so difficult, because that means that the management and the company has to allow for the strategy to be distributed. And they have to empower everybody in their own department, in their own responsibility, to think strategically and make strategic decisions. So, you have first, you need the management first to submit to that, to that way of thinking and empowering people. And then people themselves have to get that feeling and that leap of faith of giving power to the data. And that could be, that could be a, a pretty, pretty tough, both for the managers and for the employees saying, I'm, not, I'm, losing, I'm losing control of my job. You know, I'm just looking at a number and then I will make a decision based on that number. So this is, of course, completely untrue. You have more power and you have more things to imagine and more insight to generate when you are, when you are data driven. And as I, as I pointed out, you have less stress and you have more time to think ahead and to make better planning and deliver better results for your company. So technology, as a, I would say, as an as a underlying layer, yes, but it's really strategical. Very interesting. So one example there, when it's not about technology that I'm thinking about uh, at the end of my mind, is, uh, is about companies which are getting data driven, usually they remove piece of technology and thinking about, for example, uh, approval processes. In a lot of companies you have at certain level, when you want to make some action, you need an approval from your manager. And if this approval is beyond a certain level, you get another one. So there's a lot of tools which are set in place to make this happen. Approval is made, uh, reminders because the boss forgets to, to approve, etc. In a data-driven company, all this piece of technology, which can be huge, it can be weaved in everywhere into the systems, get removed. Because in a data-driven company, the data is available. So if someone is making something which is out 
of what it should be, it becomes immediately clear. You see it immediately. The approval process is not there anymore. So actually, it's about simplifying the technology also sometimes. Excellent. I have a question that I love. <laughs> it's about skills. It's about people again. We'd love to discuss with you a little bit what do you think are the, the, the key skills in order to have a data-driven culture, a data-driven organization? How can you make sure that you have the right skills to lead this transformation? So first of all, you don't need to be a data scientist. <laughs> Number one. <laughs> so there's this belief and, there, uh, and there's this uh, uh, kind of a way of approaching data-driven culture by creating a data team with data scientists, data engineers, data, data this and data that and that. To me, this is exactly the wrong way of doing it because you're putting the responsibility there for the data where it, should be, where it should be everybody's responsibility. As, as we explained, ownership has to be distributed. So, you, so there is a use for data scientists, but for me, they don't come at the beginning. You know? At the beginning, you need awareness. I hope today we, we went into that direction and we raised awareness. You need curiosity, uh, and you need an entry level of math to understand what's happening in a good, in a good business sense. You know? Uh, the, the tools are there. I mean, most employees in most organizations, uh, they already have the tools to understand what's happening. They already have their mental model. They need the curiosity to question that, look at the data, uh, see what they have already, and already use what they have. You know, um, a lot of uh, a lot of brief, a lot of projects. They come and they and and they ask, and they, the, the brief is, we need more data. We need more data. I usually come out and I ask them and challenge them, are you sure you don't need less data, but then use it? So it starts there. So that, that first part of awareness, curiosity, doesn't require any special skills. Now what you've done, when you've done everything you can with that, then you need a data scientist. Then you need more powerful tools, but there's already a lot that can be done today without the tools, without having a PhD in, uh, in uh, statistics. I don't know if you agree with that, Guillaume, or you disagree? No, agree. agree. Another uh, important uh, skill that people need to learn when doing that is probably start trusting each other. Because you are all on the same set of data, and then being able to say that, the day, be able to know that the data is truthful, nobody has been playing with it, and trusting others to react in the right way is a very important yeah. skill in this case. Uh, I need to look it up. I think there, there was a Harvard Business Review uh, article a few years back that said the biggest problem with big data is that people need to trust them enough to follow, to follow, to follow it. You know, people have a tendency to change the decisions that are coming of predicting systems. So you implement a very advanced AI, you do a big project to bring in like 50 or 100 sources of data, and at the end, Somebody adjusts it, and and it becomes it becomes uh, irrelevant. You know, so trust the people, trust the data. Yeah. Uh, maybe we have time for for one more question. Um, if some of you wants to continue the discussion, here are the LinkedIn uh, profile, uh, Guillaume's LinkedIn and my LinkedIn. So feel free to scan and connect with us on on LinkedIn if you want to pursue and continue that discussion.